Welcome to the webinar, How to Write an Effective Resume. The goal for today's webinar is to help you refine what you have on your resume and give you a chance to learn some new ways you can highlight your skills and accomplishments while also giving you the best chance to get a job interview. The resume is the first impression an employer gets of you and it's your chance to gain the recruiter's attention. The recruiter takes about 10 to 20 seconds to look over your resume, so it's really important that you structure your resume in a way that pulls the reader in immediately. Some employers may take even less time, and you may think, that's unfair, but oftentimes they'll have a yes, a no, or a maybe pile when they initially go through the resume, so you want to impress them in those first few seconds to make it into the yes pile. You want to grab their attention from the beginning and stand out. There are three types of resumes. The chronological resume is the most common format that employers are familiar with and like to see. It leads with the most recent position and goes back in time. You may have heard it be called the reverse chronological resume style. This kind of format is often used when you have a strong career history and you want to demonstrate how you progressed over the years. It's especially useful if you have direct relevant experience. The next kind is the functional resume. It highlights and organizes your skills and abilities as opposed to detailing out the task you did at each past job. This format is most used if you have little work experience, gaps in your work history, or you're thinking about changing careers. Lastly is the combination resume. This one leads with a strong summary section and gives you a chance to highlight your area of expertise, then goes into your work history in reverse chronological order. So what should be included in a resume? The list you see here are the basic sections you would have, like the contact information, summary of skills, employment history, professional development, and education. Regardless of what resume style you pick, these are the essential parts they may just appear in a different order. You want your resume to illustrate to employers one message, which is, this is how I made things better for the companies I worked for. More employers and recruiters nowadays are saying that the objective is no longer needed because it's redundant and outdated. Even though it's meant to capture your career ambitions, objectives can become too broad, too short, and show nothing about what you can do for the employer. So leaving it off will help employers focus on your skills and what accomplishments you can bring to the table for your next potential company. When building your resume, you want to stick to using bullet points instead of long paragraphs. This makes it easier for employers to read and you want to be clear and concise with what you tell employers about yourself. Put your most important work at the beginning of the resume in a summary. Avoid including any abbreviations because you can't assume that the recruiter will know what the acronym means. For instance, instead of writing the letters CNA, write out Certified Nursing Assistant. The less guessing the employer must do, the better chance you have of being hired. You also want to begin your statements with action words and avoid using the word I. For example, if you want to say, I assisted in the training of six new employees, you can just say, assisted in the training of six new employees. Here are some examples of those action words you can use to describe the accomplishments and achievements you made for each work position. Action words are important because they make your resume clearer and more concise. By using action words, you can better paint a picture of the type of employee that you can be. For example, you can say for one of your job duties that you led weekly team meetings, or using one of the words in the list, the first word, facilitated, you can say facilitated discussions during weekly team meetings. So with the second statement, it says the same thing, but it's more specific showing what skill you use, what action you took, and just paints a better picture of what the task would look like to the employer. You want your resume to highlight your skills and accomplishments rather than just talking about your job duties. You want to show how you can add value to the company you're applying to, and then you can further explain how you use those skills in your work experience. Use present tense wording with current jobs and past tense with all your prior job experiences. You also want to use industry or job specific keywords that are listed in the job description. For example, two keyword phrases you can use are customer service and computer literate skills. To make sure you're using industry or job specific keywords listed in the job description, print out the job posting, lay it next to your master resume, which has all your skills and experiences, and start highlighting requirements and tasks from what the employer is asking for that match your own skill set. Then start typing out the tailored resume. 
never send out the same resume to all employers. Of course, you need to be honest on your resume, so for every statement you make, you want to be able to prove it in your work experience or skills description in the functional resume. So you're wondering, how do you tailor your resume? Here's an example if the job description is requiring you to be able to support several small and medium-sized office-wide projects that are directly impact the goals of the organization. You want to think about if in any of the work that you've done, if you've managed or worked on any projects. The tailor response for that task could be supporting medium-sized fundraising project for Children's Hospital by coordinating events which led to raising more money for the organization. What you want to do is take what the employer is requiring of you as the candidate, look at the work that you've done in the past, and use similar wording to explain what you did and accomplished at your previous jobs. Employers like to see it when you use job descriptions and statements that they're familiar with, so you want to keep that in mind when you're writing out the task under each job. In terms of length, keep your resume to one to two pages, at most two and a half pages, since your resume serves as a quick snapshot of your skills and work experience. You get a chance to explain those in further detail in the interview, so don't bog your resume down explaining too much. Sometimes companies may request only one page resume, so that's really when you want to be strategic and clear in what you want to include. And the rule is to go back no longer than 10 years of experience. You want to avoid putting personal information like marital status or social security number. And lastly, don't list your references or put references upon request. It makes your resume dated and is a space filler. If employers want references, they'll ask you to submit it separately, either as an attachment or be given on the day of the interview. A common mistake often seen in resume writing is a lack of specifics in the descriptions of what people did at their previous jobs. People often only write out what they did and not what they achieved or accomplished. So here, we'll go over some statements that aren't as good and how you can make them better. So the first one, this person stated they recruited and filled open positions. This statement is okay, but it's pretty generalized and it doesn't tell the employer what they did and how they made an impact. Taking that same statement and making it more specific, you can say developed a recruiting strategy over seven states that resulted in 137 positions being filled within 60 days. Here, you can see that when you're explaining what you did for each job, you want to remember that employers like to see numbers in your statements to help them visualize how you use your skills in your previous positions, so it's good to be as detailed as possible. Quantify as much information as you can, so that means using numbers, dollar signs, percentages, statistics, and words like increase or decrease to help make what you did sound more clear. This is another example of how to turn a general statement into a more specific one. Instead of saying directed recruiting efforts for East Division, you can say responsible for coordinating a team of recruiters across seven states that were accountable for sourcing, interviewing, and hiring 75 positions for the department. So again, using numbers and action words like responsible and accountable helps to make the statement clear for employers to visualize what you did and what impact you made. Before getting into an alternative that can be used in place of an objective, here are three reasons why it's recommended to not include it in your resume. Objectives are redundant, candidate-focused statements, and old-fashioned. To the first point, you're already applying for the position, so it should be clear to the employer already what your objective is, and beyond that, it doesn't give the employer any new information about you. Secondly, objectives can be very candidate-focused statements. That means that the statements focuses only on you and your interests as the job seeker and what you're looking for in a job. But think back to what was said earlier about the purpose of the resume. It's a way to quickly sell yourself to show employers why you're the best candidate. So when employers read your resume, they want to envision what you can do for them, not the other way around. Lastly, because the objective statement is an older resume trend, it's old-fashioned and using one could unintentionally reveal your age. So if you like the idea of using an objective, an alternative would be a summary statement. It communicates what you could bring to the company as an employee. It tells employers who you are and what you can do by leading with your accomplishments, relevant skills, and other credentials that demonstrate your value as a candidate. 
Think of it like an elevator pitch to start off your resume. And it also helps answer the question, why should a company hire you? Here we have an example of what that might look like. At the top, you see Matthew put in bold a job title to show his experience as a workforce development professional and described very briefly what he could bring to another company. He said he's a seasoned career specialist offering tailored career counseling, coaching, and job seeker services, and he's had a 90% successful employment placement rate. So here, he has a very brief statement on how he could add value to the company he wants to work for. Then he goes on to list out his summary of skills to support the summary statement he just wrote above. He used bullet points like we discussed earlier to keep it easy to read and picks out skills that support what he does as a career specialist, like resume writing assistance and soft skills versus hard skills analysis. When you're writing out your statements, it can be one to four sentences that highlight your most relevant strengths and skills that will bring value to the position and company you want to apply for, and using numbers will boost your accomplishments and skills even more. We talked a little bit about the summary skills in the last slide, but diving deeper into what it is, it should consist of a few brief statements describing why you're the perfect candidate for the job. There are four categories. The first are hard skills, which are specific, teachable, tangible, and more technical. They can be measured and tested using assessments, and they're also learned either through on-the-job training or through school. For example, accounting and sales and computer programming. Soft skills are a little harder to measure. There are personality traits and interpersonal skills that come more naturally rather than being learned through school. These are the kinds of skills you're born with and can grow and develop over time from your upbringing, education, and experiences. For example, being hardworking, being punctual, being a leader, and a strong communicator. Employers most often prefer for a candidate to have more soft skills over hard skills because hard skills can easily be learned on the job and usually employers are flexible with teaching you the hard skills needed for their job as long as you're willing to learn. Transferable skills can be carried with you from one job to the other. These skills can be a hard or soft skill as long as they can be used in any type of role regardless of the industry, company, or position. For example, having an attention to detail, customer service, professionalism, or phone etiquette. Lastly, job-related skills are usually hard skills that are relevant to a certain type of role or position. So you want to keep in mind these four types of skills when you're deciding what skills you want to highlight at the top of your resume. Things that you can list out in your summary include other languages spoken, awards and accomplishments in past jobs, relevant classes, number of people you managed, and certifications you've achieved. Here is a list of specific examples of all four types of skills you can mention. You can say you have four solid years in the human resource field, knowledge of federal and state employment laws, ability to type 50 words per minute, or that you're multilingual in Spanish, German, or Portuguese. In the second portion of this webinar, we'll talk about three different resume styles and look at examples for each format. The first resume style is a chronological resume, which is the format that focuses on relevant professional experience and achievements. This format can be used if you have several years of experience in one career path, you worked for several employers or clients in one industry, and you have minimal or no gaps in your work history. Here is what a chronological resume might look like. What we're going to be focusing on is the format since your resume serves as the first impression of you to the employer before they can meet you for an interview. The more modern preferred fonts are Cambria and Calibri with a size 10 or 11 point font and your name in the header can be 18 to 20 point font. Times New Roman makes your resume sort of dated, but if you like the old fashioned style, Cambria is a good font choice for you. The important thing to remember is to keep the same font type and style throughout your resume. This includes how you bold and italicize your headers or anything on the page you want to emphasize. This helps keep your resume look more clean and professional. The top section would be the contact information. You no longer need to put your full address in there, just the minimum of your city, state, and zip code is enough. 
With your phone number, make sure it's a number that employers can easily reach you at. Same goes for your email. Be mindful of your email and that it's professional. If it's something like twizzlergirl97 at gmail.com, it's best to leave that for your personal use and create a new one with your first and last name and some numbers is fine too. With the skills section, you want to make it easy for employers to read. So like we saw earlier with the summary section underneath the summary statement, organizing it with bullet points gives you more white space and allows you to be specific with what skills you have. The two bullet points at the end are bolded as a strategic move to bring attention to them as they may be skills that employers are directly looking for. Like we saw earlier in the webinar, the bolded header Human Resources Manager is something you can include that's simple to showcase to the employer what kind of job title you have experience in. This next section we have is the work experience. You want to list jobs and accomplishments that gave you the skills and qualifications that employers are looking for in a candidate so you don't have to list your entire work history. If you have unrelated jobs that still fill in gaps in your work history, just include a brief description. If you do have gaps in your work history, we'll talk about the functional resume format after this style that emphasizes your skills. As a style preference, you can put the company name, city, and state on the left side, and on the right side, put the dates of employment. This makes it easier to read and give you more white space to break up the information. You want to make sure your headings, font size, and font type are consistent throughout each section. Be mindful that this resume you're looking at is through PowerPoint, so it will look different when you're typing it up in Word documents. What you want to show when you're writing out the task for your jobs is what did you do, how did you do it, and what impact did it have for the organization you worked for. So this person separated their job duties from their accomplishments, which is something you can do to further emphasize it, or you can combine the two. For instance, taking the first bullet point at the top and combining it with the last bullet point under accomplishments, your description can say, prepared and placed job ads, coordinated internal job postings, and performed reference and background checks, which increased number of placements by 70% in 12 months. How you frame and word your job descriptions can be something you can play around with to see what works best for you. The last section is the education. It's an essential part of your resume, but the emphasis you give it depends on your goals and the stage you're at in your career. Most universities will tell you if you're a new graduate or have limited work experience to put your education first. Or if you're changing careers and you just finished a certification, credential, or some type of training, you can place education before your work experience if it's your strongest qualification. If you've been in the workforce for a while, you want to highlight your skills and accomplishments you've gained through your jobs, so putting the education last is more ideal. Again, this is just preference, but you can highlight the degree and put the university's name in italics. It doesn't necessarily have to look exactly like this. It's just about breaking the information down so it's cleaner and easier to read. When you're putting your education and certification, make sure you write out where you got your degree and when you got it. This is important for job fields like information technology, which look for candidates that are up to date with certifications and current softwares and programs. If your degree is still within the past 15 years, you can include the date that you got it. If it's past that, you can leave off the graduation date since it can call attention to your age for older workers. In summary, a chronological format resume highlights your employment history and the skills and accomplishments through your job duties. It helps employers quickly understand the value of your most recent and relevant work experiences. It's best used when you have several years of experience in one career path, you worked for several employers or clients in one industry, and you have minimal or no gaps between jobs. For the descriptions, it should answer three questions. What did you do? How did you do it? And what impact did you make? The next type of resume we'll look at is the functional resume. This resume style highlights career achievements from past job experiences it emphasizes the job seeker's skills and abilities. It's effective to show how your skills transfer to a new career or industry. The style is used if there is little work history, spotty work record, 
for gaps in the work history, and for career changers who want to emphasize transferable skills. With any resume style that you pick, one section that will always be needed is the header, which contains the contact information. An option is to include a summary statement like we talked about earlier in place of the objective. This can give employers more context about you, and you can include your primary experience and any relevant skills that you have that you know employers are looking for with the position. Then you want to list out with bullet points your skills that you've acquired over the years that show how you are the best candidate for the job. The career achievement section is where you'll list out things that you've achieved through using your skills that you either gained on the job or learned through experience rather than listing out job duties like in the chronological style. This can be done in a few ways. It all just depends on how you want to showcase how you practically use your skills at your jobs. You can do it this way, like you see here on this slide, where bullet points are used to organize what was done and what was accomplished, and then in parentheses is the name of the organization that the skill was gained at. This is a different example of how you can write out your skills and achievements. The skills on this slide are grouped with descriptive headers or themes. To help you think of what phrases to use, you can use the job description to draw keywords to help inform your skills groupings. Maybe the employer is looking for someone who has shown experience in taking care of other people, or someone who has experience in recreations and physical therapy. So you have care and support and recreational physical therapy as two optional headers. Then under each header, include two to five examples of how you use that type of skill in your work experience. Lastly is the education section, which looks similar to a chronological resume. In terms of the formatting, the same style preferences can apply. You can include the name of the institution, area of study, GPA, any relevant achievements, and the type of diploma you received if you think it's applicable to show the employers you are the best candidate for their job. Remember to consider what to include in each section based on your own career situation and think about which details of your professionalism will help portray you as a strong candidate. If you do have limited work experience, you can expand upon other areas like volunteer experiences, internships, fellowships, awards you've achieved, projects you participated in managed, and study abroad programs to show that you do have skills and work history that can be applied to a job. Secondly, you want to think about mentioning transferable skills. These are broken down into three categories. The first are people skills, like communicating, teaching, coaching, and supervising. Data skills, like record keeping, researching, translating information, and coding and functional skills like washing, cleaning, operating computers, assembling, and repairing. For example, if you're a stay-at-home parent and you want to get into the workforce, there are skills that you do every day for your family that can be applied to a job. If you manage your own taxes or bank account, you have clerical knowledge of managing files and records, which is needed in a position as a file clerk or you're the primary caretaker for your elderly parents, so you do have the knowledge and experience providing support for others in which you can apply to working in a nursing home. So what you want to do if you have limited work experience is think about the skills you already possess and exercise every day and look at how they're similar to what employers are requiring. Don't be discouraged if you don't have exactly what they're looking for. You likely do have the skills all that's needed is reframing how you think about it. Lastly, you want to ask yourself these questions. What can you do well that this job requires? What will be useful to the hiring company? What have you done in school or in your extracurricular activities? And what have you studied that has prepared you for assuming this job? In summary, a functional resume can be used to highlight your skills and accomplishments over your work history. When writing out your career achievements, you can use themes or skill categories taken from the job description to explain the skills you've gained from past work. And lastly, this type of resume style is best used if you have limited work experience, gaps in your work history, and your changing careers.
With the functional resume, it doesn't show much detail about where you got the skills you gained, like the location and dates of employment, so it leaves a few holes and red flags for employers to question how valid is the information. If you can't use a chronological resume, the best alternative is the combination resume. It leads with a strong summary section, highlights your area of expertise, and follows the reverse chronological work history. So it's combining the two strong features of a chronological resume and a functional resume into one. The combination resume starts off and ends the same as a chronological and functional resume. You want the header with your contact information, with your name, address, phone number, email, and here this person also included their LinkedIn website. You can also include a summary statement with the one-line job title and a few sentences to talk about the relevant things about yourself that you want employers to know and a few bullet points for your skill sets. Then you get into the professional experience and this section puts together the chronological style piece which is writing out dates of employment first with the name of the organization and a sentence about your job duties. Then using bullet points you'll create skill categories that you can come up with based on the job description to explain what you accomplished and what impact you made at your jobs. This way of breaking down the professional experience gives employers a straightforward way of knowing where you gained employment, what you did, and how you use your skills to benefit the organization you worked for. The last section is the education. You can choose any style you want to emphasize your college name, degree, and year of graduation as long as it matches and is consistent with the style you chose for the rest of your resume. For instance, if you bolded the company name for your professional experience, you can bold the college name for the education. And if you write a line the dates of employment, then you can write a line the graduation date in this section. It all goes back to having a style that's clean, easy, and professional to read. You can also include any professional development courses, trainings, or certifications underneath your education if you find it relevant to what the employer is looking for as well as professional associations or memberships that you gained experience from. In summary, the combination resume format emphasizes both skills, accomplishments, and recent work history. It can help highlight skills gained as an early career professional and help connect those skills to the few years of professional experience you have. It's a good choice if you're a junior to mid-level candidate with relevant skills that match the job description. The combination resume is good to use if you're an early career professional with one to three years of job experience, you're a recent college graduate or high school graduate with minimum work experience, you're changing careers or industries, you worked with only a few employers but have consistent work history, and you have little to no gaps in your work history. In this last portion of the webinar, we'll discuss resume mistakes, give you a resume checklist to use, and talk about email etiquette. If the resume is too short, it won't give employers a good picture of what you can offer as an employee, but if it's too long, they may pass your resume on into the no pile. So again, a good length would be one to two pages, maximum two and a half pages. If you're writing a federal resume or a CV, which is a curriculum vitae, usually used in education, those require you to explain in more detail about your skills and professional experience, but for the purpose of a job outside of those industries, one to two pages is a good length. It's important to note that one resume does not fit for all jobs, which is why you should always tailor your resume to the job description instead of sending out the same one. Be sure to look over your resume for typos and punctuation. Since you're the one who's writing the resume, you may not catch all the errors because you're reading it how you want it to sound. It can be helpful to ask someone like a friend or a career coach at the Virginia Career Work Centers to take a look at your resume to make suggestions and help you make changes from a different perspective. You want to highlight your achievements, not just what you did, but what did you accomplish by using your skills. Lastly, don't assume the employer or recruiter knows what you did at your previous jobs. Write out everything and be as clear and specific as possible. Here is a checklist you can use to make sure your resume looks professional. Think about the visual impact. Check to see that it's neat, clean, on good quality paper, and easy to scan into a computer if you're handing employers a physical copy. Your resume doesn't have to be on resume paper, 
any good copy or paper is fine. With the layout, your resume should be typed with good margins and use of white space, use of upper and lowercase letters, bolding, or italics to highlight important information. Again, be mindful of the length and ask yourself, could the resume tell the same story if it were shorter? And with the writing style, check to see if your resume is clear, concise, and the information is organized in a way that flows well, and it uses good word choice, which you can do by using those action words we mentioned earlier in the webinar and similar words in the job description. Make sure your resume is action and achievement oriented. Are your skills and achievements emphasized? And are the descriptions quantified using numbers? The resume should also be specific and relevant. When you're looking over your resume, ask yourself, has all needless unnecessary information been eliminated? Does the resume focus on specific information about experiences and accomplishments related to the job? Bottom line is, you need to ask yourself, does the resume achieve its purpose? Does it build interest on the part of the employer? Does it get you invited in for an interview? When you're sending your resume to an employer or recruiter, you want to be professional, not personal. This means you don't want to sound like you're commanding employers to look at your resume or leave out important information like why you're emailing the employer. You also don't want to say too much or say nothing at all and just attach your resume. Remember, employers judge your first meeting whether in person, by phone, through email or video, and they look for professionalism in your communication. So what is the etiquette for sending your resume through email? Always follow the employer's instructions on how to submit your job materials. The job posting should give you detailed information on how you're expected to apply, and if it doesn't, look for a person's contact information to reach out to them, or move on to another job if no instructions are given on how to apply. You may be asked to upload your resume online or to email your resume. If the request is through email, employers will advise you on things like formatting, what to include in the subject line of the email, and the submission date. For example, the employer may request that you upload or email your documents in a PDF format or a DOC format, which is for Microsoft Word. If they don't specify what type of document they want, always send it in a PDF format since it's easier to read electronically and your resume can't be edited by the person who's looking at your resume. When you email documents, they're typically added to the message as an attachment. Keep in mind that some employers don't accept attachments. In that case, you can paste your resume into your email message as plain text. If there are no instructions, the best and easiest way is as an attachment. Don't send emails without a subject line because then employers won't know why you emailed them. It may just delete your email if they see it come up as blank. Out of common courtesy and professionalism, don't send an email without a greeting and an introduction to who you are and a couple lines in the body of the email about why you're reaching out to the employer. Here is a simple template you can use to format your email when you send your resume to an employer. The template reads, Dear Ms. Jane Doe, I received your job posting from Indeed and I am responding with my resume for your review. I have eight years experience in the healthcare industry and it is my hope that this will lead me to an interview with you. Sincerely, Joe Doe. So notice in this email, four things were communicated in this short response. Number one, the manager was addressed appropriately by using their name. In case you don't have a name, using HR manager is fine too. Number two, the applicant addressed where they received the job lead from. For this, you can say a job search database, or you can mention the person that referred you the job. This shows that you have a common connection, which is very important because employers like to know that your skill set and experiences can be trusted and vouched for by another person. Number three, the person included their years of experience in a specific industry which references the job that they're applying to. And number four, they express their desire to interview for the position. So this is just a quick email that's simple but tells employers why you're emailing them and you're interested in the job vacancy. If you are in need of resume assistance, the Virginia Career Work Center is available to help you. If you would like to contact a member of the Virginia Career Works for Effects Center team, 
please use the email you see on the screen or give the center a call and a career service specialist will be in contact with you for further assistance. For additional employment and training resources, you may visit our Fairfax County page to find more information on resume writing, cover letter, virtual job fair, and employment and training programs for youth and adults. We also have a new newsletter that is available. If you would like to receive weekly information on job leads, upcoming webinars, and employment events, you may scroll to the bottom of the page and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. And that concludes the content for this presentation today. Thank you so much for joining our webinar.